Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome back, everybody, to episode 64 of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. Today is October 24th, 2020. I'm Bill, and I'm joined, as always, by my aerodynamic co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Welcome, guys. <laughs> Man, Thank you've you. never said a bold-faced lie before, but... Uh, I don't get, know, I mean... I'm getting less what? aerodynamic by the day. <laughs> we, we, could, uh, we could toss you and, you know, Just see how far out. you go. Just see how it works. Everything's airdroppable at least once. Did I say October? Or I thought I said August. Cheyenne is saying that I said October. If I did, I meant it is August 24th, whatever <laughs> day it is. It's a day. It's 2020, so the days are kind of running together anyway. I mean, if you, anyway. if you round, it's basically October. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they had the Halloween decorations out, you know, so it's, it's all, it's October, right? That's going to be my new way of introducing dates. Uh, basically October 2020. It's fine. Plus yeah. October, we've got something cool coming up. Uh, we'll... Uh, Announce that probably in our next episode, actually, yeah. just this, exactly what's happening yeah. in October. But it's pretty cool. So uh, start, you know, biting your nails and getting anxious for it because it's it's going to be awesome. Um, before we get started, we do want to remind our listeners that the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is not a spoiler free podcast. That means if there is something in the Cosmere that you haven't read and you're worried that you're going to hear spoilers, you might want to go ahead and read those first, then come back here and join the discussion. Particularly right now, as we continue to discuss the chapters from the as yet unpublished Rhythm of War that Brandon is releasing early on tour.com. And tonight we are going to be discussing chapters two and three. Now, for those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube after the fact, we do want to remind you, you can actually come join in and interact with us live via chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night, starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us, take an active part in the discussion, just come and have fun and be here with us. The, the chat's growing and we've got some fun discussions going on in there. So we would love to have you. Please just distract us because that's good television. So. <laughs> now, the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. The show will continue to be free, of course, but if you want to help us out, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Even pledging a dollar or two each episode really helps as we work to improve the show. Pat patrons get immediate access to our Discord channel where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. We've got a great community. We've got a lot of great discussions. And it just it gets better as each new person joins. It's just a lot of fun. So uh, you'll also get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and other good stuff. This week, we want to especially thank uh, new patrons Alfonsina C. and Tomas V. Thank you for for supporting the show and just being all around awesome. Gracias. I almost said that's Donata like, reflexively from my years of high school Spanish. That's like, that's like all the Spanish I really know is like that and like a few random words. That, that's so, not yeah. for you to say, Jordan. I that's know. Not your... that's, that's where the fourth year of the Spanish comes in and it got me to stop. Per particularly since it translates into, you know, it's nothing. Yeah. And so you're basically, degree, you know, <laughs> saying yeah. that their help is nothing. And Jordan, I oh. really, how could you? I've said, it, I've said it before. I know just enough Spanish to be very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, so guys, let's uh, dive on in. As you know, as we've mentioned before, Brandon is releasing chapters of Rhythm of War leading up to its release on November 17th. By the time November 17th rolls around, we'll probably, I think he said, we'll actually have all of part one. So, you know, just releasing 20% of his book for free. And that 20% of his book being the length of most other books. It's pretty cool. Because Brandon's fun. 
Now, if you're new to the podcast, you might be wondering why last week we discussed the prologue and this week we're jumping ahead to chapter two. That's because we actually already discussed chapter one back in December when Brandon released it as part of his newsletter. So if you want to go back and listen to that discussion, it was released on December 4th and it's titled Feel the Rhythm. So uh, let's jump into the discussion. I so, forgot that title. I like that title. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first off, let's go to the epigrams because I, you know I love the epigrams. I Thank always you. love epigrams. And this one is a good, nice, juicy one because it's apparently from a lecture on fabrial mechanics presented by Navani Kolin to the Coalition of Monarchs in Eurotheru, Yesevan, 1175. Yesevan is one of the months of mm. the year. I um, so I'm just going to go ahead and read this one. It says, The final step in capturing Spren is the most tricky, as you must remove the stormlight from the gemstone. The specific techniques employed by each artifabrian guild are closely guarded secrets entrusted only to their most senior members. The easiest method would be to use a larkin, a type of Kremlin that feasts on stormlight. That would be wonderful and convenient if the creatures weren't now almost entirely extinct. The wars in Amia were in part over these seemingly innocent little creatures. Hmm. So first off, she called it a, a lark and a Kremling. Well, everything which, is a Kremlin. Right, but I mean, we've seen pictures of, of Larkins and they look more dragon-like. But they have, they have like the scale layer thing going I on guess. that Kremlings sound to have. So I guess it's more just of like how we have mammals and we have reptiles and different things like that. They probably just have Kremlings. I just think they're three-year-olds they and everything a cow. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we have the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. They have the the Kremlin kingdom and the chicken kingdom. Yes. And the right. horse kingdom. And the horse the, <laughs> You know. It's all good. Roshar sounds fun. <laughs> really? Because it doesn't. Because it's constantly trying to kill you. It has cr- just crustaceans that are the size of houses. So what everything you're sa- is seafood. So what you're thing. saying is that Roshar is Australia. Basically, best word about can, Australia's can't remember where it's from. We just talk about Australia's where God put his endgame raid content. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm not even gonna touch that one. I don't even know. Okay, so let's move and, and actually let's talk about the, the next chapter's epigram as well, just to keep that together so we can continue. The discussion mm-hmm. without breaking up. The next one is the final step in capturing Spren is the most tricky, as you must remove the stormlight from the gemstone. The this specific is, techniques. Already, didn't you read that one? No, that's. I think that. you. Oh, I, I did. I, you, I, that's yeah, you the read second them out of order. One. The first one. Sorry, I am I. <laughs> you know, a reader person who um, remember what was it? Engel talking that I said I was yeah. good at. Yeah, you did say Engel talking. <laughs> So, uh, next, let the Sprint inspect your trap. The gemstone must not be fully infused, but also cannot be fully done. Experiments have concluded that 70% of maximum stormlight capacity works best. If you've done your work correctly, the Sprint will become fascinated by its soon-to-be prison. It will dance around the stone, peek at it, float around it. So, I love that we're getting this look at kind of how Fabrials work, and I love the way that Brandon is explaining it to us, because... He talks in writing excuses about info dumps and how they can be problematic. Mm-hmm. And what he's done is he's made an info dump, but made it fit into the narrative. And it's, it's kind of cool. Well, Cause he really didn't make mm-hmm. it fit into the narrative. He actually just put it apart from the narrative altogether. How do except I get so that, used to it? Yeah. That we except, don't, it that, bug us. except that it is part of the narrative because it's actually a lecture that is being given about it. And so, and it, so it makes sense for it to be explained in this, very it, analytical in, and dry manner. Yeah, and that's the but the thing is, he would never make a scene of her giving this lecture. Right. Like it only works yeah. because he he picked if, the epigram to do so. If if he did have that scene, it would gloss over a lot of what is being said. Mm-hmm. And it would be other stuff that he would focus on compared to here's the lecture for three hours or whatever. But, else. but again, the way he's done it, it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, we're we're getting the info dump and not feeling like uh get on with the action. Like this is just, yeah. I mean, I know some people, there are very, very mixed feelings about the epigrams I've noticed. Mm-hmm. If you read a lot of the discussions, but I, I love it. And I just, I, the way that it, it's just packed in tight and dense and it's just a nice. I, I don't like mm. sometimes if it's in the middle of a fight 
like if the previous <laughs> chapter ends with a fight and then it's a fight that continuing and there's an epigram in the middle because I'm like, I know this is important, but I really want to follow the fight. And so I don't like that aspect of it, but I do like that it breaks up a lot of the info dumps into little chunks. So it's not so much of a, a huge mm -hmm. avalanche well, of information. An info dump is much like a spice and it has to be used sparingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. And it just, it's, the thing is, the thing that I like about it, though, even if it does show up in the middle of a fight, a lot of times Brandon has spaced it out to the point where the epigram will inform something that happens. And so you can sometimes take a little bit of a clue for mm -hmm. of what's happening based on an epigram. So it yeah. gives you just that little taste of, ooh, what's going to happen next? Ooh, ooh, they're commenting on that. But yeah, like I, it's usually on rereads that I catch those compared to my first reads because I'm, I'm too excited to to keep reading that I miss little things a mm -hmm. lot more than my first read through. But that's why right. you keep rereading. Oh, if only so there was good. time, just all the time. Yeah, it's, it's so funny just because each book I've read of Brandon's is so much better each consecutive time. I, re I remember, and there's a lot of complaints about each of the Stormlight books. Like some people love one more than the other. Um, Oathbringer got a lot of flack at first because it takes a while to build up, but mm -hmm. going back and rereading it, you see where it's building to and it just works. I just mm -hmm. find that hilarious as a criticism just because it's like, that's a metaphor for literally the entire Stormlight archive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Book one was nothing but build up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it in the time, but then you look at that one compared to the other uh, books and you're like, oh, I yeah, like it for me up. personally, that's but anyway, it's but it was one of those things, I trust Brandon. It's just like, I trust this mm -hmm. is going somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I think he's got a handle on this, and this guy's going to take off a little bit. Yeah, I think okay. he, he he might do well for himself, you know, if yeah. somebody picks actually picks him up and reads him and gives him a chance. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So let's dive into Chapter 2, Severed Chords, which mm -hmm. when <laughs> after the the... There's a, multi, a dual meaning, and one of them is kind of grim. I just one, clicked into what that is. <laughs> it's Kaladin's <laughs> spinal cord. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, it is. But yeah, so if you recall... Stormlight's you know, one heck of a drug. <laughs> <laughs> but if you recall, you know, several months ago, at the end of Chapter 1, which was from Lyran's perspective, Kaladin was spotted and immediately sucked in Stormlight. And I was like, and he burst a light. It was just like, oh, Kaladin knows how to make an entrance. He does. But yeah, so it seems like Kaladin and Lyran are having troubles. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, not, they're coming. Uh, they, have, they have similar end goals, like very end goals, but how mm -hmm. they plan to get there is very different. Yeah. Like at one point, Kaladin talks about he he avoided his father's gaze because he knew what he'd see there disappointment see, and just like it's always like, so you and it's see there like, and then it's like well, next, that's next line disappointment that was mm -hmm. just a one word sentence like, just oh. like always is the other thing mm -hmm. yeah and it's just ah it's so rough yeah it's but you know it's what their relationship is yeah mm -hmm. i mean but the thing is they never had a perfect relationship, but it feels like it's more strained than it's ever been. And well, that's it's Kaladin, kind of sad after the... Kaladin went to war. Like, that changes him. Mm -hmm. Lyran wants yeah. him to be his, his little surgeon again. Mm -hmm. But he was never that kid. He never felt alive until he picked up a spear. This is what yeah. he yeah. was designed for. And he's using his surgeon's knowledge now for a much more grisly purpose, Ooh, because now yeah. he knows exactly where to attack. But, but, yeah, all the spots. Well, speaking of attacking, purpose. holy crap, the fight with this Nightcrawler well, fused. Yeah. This oh new my fuse. goodness. This Except that it's not, it's rough. like creepier version of Nightcrawler because yeah, it's like it leaves a heavy husk. Yeah, it's like armored, yeah, and like it turns to dust. Uh -huh. It's freaky. Ugh. It's, uh, well, the thing that I like about it, as far as, first of all, the fact that, uh, what was the quote? Uh, he looked... Fight, fuse, comparison, Kaladin, blah, blah, blah. The, fro the fog-shrouded figure in the near distance collapsed suddenly, and something shot out of his yeah. body, a small mm -hmm. line of red-violet, mm -hmm. like a spren. And so mm -hmm. if you can 
keep track of the lot, the whatever this laser is. Although personally, I imagine it more sort of like uh, if you're familiar with DC Comics, Dark Side's uh, Omega Beams. I just imagine it mm-hmm. darting all around to try mm-hmm. and peer behind you, type of thing. Yeah, and this right. one does. It goes behind him once or twice. But I love the name. He says, uh, uh, it expanded to reform the shape of the fused with a sound like stretching leather mixed with grinding stone. Ugh. Ew. I get the impression that this power is not uh, comfortable. Mm-mm. No. Which, which would explain so. why Kaladin expected sort of a, a duel like he got with the, the flying ones. Mm-hmm. And he's like, mm-hmm. nah, and he signals everyone else to attack first. So imagine yeah. if it's like, no, no, let's gang up on it. So it, clearly, like the orders, quote, orders of fused are, are very different, kind of like the orders of radiance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was another thing that was really interesting because Yasna assumes that there are going to be 10 different varieties of the fuse, but Dalinar says there's only going to be nine. And Dalinar says it was some certainty. Mm-hmm. And I love Kaladin's response. He didn't give any reason how he knew that, but... <laughs> he just, he just don't question know, that. But yeah. Well, I just I so, think that nine's Odium is number. Like, right, hmm. but the, the thing about that is if that's the case and each of the varieties of fuse only has one surge... Which one is missing? I would assume Bondsman. I, I, I think you're probably that, right. But. That would make sense. Yeah, I could see that. It's just because that's that's specifically the art of making oaths, and that's very on Of unity. Mm-hmm. Of, the, of, of binding things, yeah. 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 A- and, and odium is much more along the lines of dividing, which also makes you worry... What are the uh, fuse who's use the surge of division going to be? I've been oh. I've been wondering that, and I've been looking forward to it. That just mm. se- the, uh. <laughs> no, thank you. All right, so Kaladin draws it away from the town, and yeah, this one is just this one knows how to fight radiance surge binders mm-hmm. because it gets behind him, and then it just continually stabs him through the spine. Over and over, and as it heals, he does it him. again. Just basically trying to drain his stormlight. Mm-hmm. It's well, messed up, man. Well, and if you remember, um, as the fused were running from the Battle of Thalen Field, we got Venli's perspective, and she talked about how the fused were offering up excuses for their defeat, and they said, oh, we've only got the weakest of us, you know, wait until we have the, you know, some of our more powerful, mm-hmm. you know, brethren back, and she was sort of like, what a weird way to deal with, you know, defeat. You know, you, you lost. Sort of mm-hmm. sort of like suck it up, buttercup. Uh, but <laughs> meanwhile, they know what they have in store. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, we're now starting to see what they have in store. And oh, it's like, well. Oh, scary. But look, fight, like, again, what? fighting Nightcrawler sucks. And, that, and yeah. that's the other thing. It's not just because first off, it's scary. Second off, it's nasty. Like, it's just mean and rude mm-hmm. and raw. And apparently it's um, ugly as well, according to Syl. <laughs> <laughs> and when uh, when Kaladin escapes, it tells him, watch from the corner of your eye. Am I, I'm just imagining him coming at him like a raptor from the side. <laughs> just, I need one clever, clever girl, girl in this book. <laughs> I'll, I will uh, be all in for that. Mm-hmm. Between that and let's smell what Rock is cooking. And then suddenly there's a spinoff. <laughs> it's called Rex and Blue and... All of Jordan's mm. dreams come true. So. <laughs> now, it seems like Syl is kind of worried about Kaladin now because he's always looks tired and apparently mm-hmm. he isn't sleeping. And from the way they talk about it, it sounds like this is not the first time they've had this discussion. I'm sure. This sounds like nagging mm-hmm. that I am familiar with. But I like uh, I like Syl's. She's like, how can it be hard? You've literally been practicing this every single day of your life. Babies Since you were born. You know, Babies like, do you it. You lay down. You pretend you're dead for several hours. You get up. What's difficult about this? It's just, it's, it's nice so to see. Even, even though she's, you know, becoming more human, the more she bonds with Kaladin and stuff like that, there are still th- concepts that are absolutely alien to her. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, having, being a mom, yeah. Sometimes babies don't want to sleep, even though you're like, come on. just I, That's what you need to do. Just, just do it. And it's, mm-hmm. the only but, person who can make him do that is themselves yeah hard. but I also like that she teases him like the way mm-hmm. she te- she's starting to tease him 
in a much more familiar light rather than just I'm a new person and hey, let's have fun. Like she knows him. So she knows how to tease him specifically. Mm hmm. Um, and like she grumps around. Also, I'm banning toes. And he's just like, you're doing what now? <laughs> People are tripping too much. So clearly it's toes. That's fault. obviously we... the problem. Yeah. My, fa- my favorite lie she said was after the fight. It was like, we showed him. And it's like, he almost killed me twice. I didn't tell what we co- showed him. It's just, just that we showed him. <laughs> but it almost sounds like someone just repeating a line they've heard too many times. Or, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah their their that. banter is evolving, and I kind of love that because you know mm. we're a few years in now, and so they've they've been together yeah. for a while. They get each other. They know each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he heads off. Uh, they head back to Hearthstone, and there's a bunch of singers there. And Kaladin's basically like, "Leave! I'm giving you a chance <laughs> to leave now." And they charge him, and he just kills all of. Or he just kills one of them. Should and have the like, done that. Nope. And the rest of them, or oh, what's her name? Uh, the one who's in Lara? charge. No, the 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 singer who's in charge. Oh. I forget. Oh, Brian. It starts with an ah. A. Ah, I can't remember her I, name. Yeah. Anyway, it's 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 anyway. She is just like, let's get out of here, and they they all head out. And then we and then Cal starts chatting with his mom. <laughs> And <laughs> poor Cal, because Hasina and Syl start chatting with each other about, of course, about him like he's not even there. <laughs> he, I, I have I love, never I related to any Brandon character <laughs> at any moment more than this moment right here. I love his line. He's like, they're like, he just oh, you know, he, he did so the repeating of it, reporting on him, and he's like, he's right here. Well, and apparently him talking? and Lynn were a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, then he got dumped. I think a lot of people have been shipping Kaladin and Lynn, and so I think Brandon decided to just not just to kill that ship, but to do it off screen. Mm. <laughs> and it's just sort of a whatever. We like, could get more. Yeah, yeah. They dated, and it didn't work. So sorry, guys. Doesn't work. <laughs> well, we sort of skipped over uh, a, a thing in the middle of all that. What was that? Do we want? Do we want to Shallan. finish? Um... Oh no! Do you want to finish the Kaladin I think, I think we'll just go through the Kaladin it? story, okay. and we'll come back to cool. Just, just because that way we can talk about the two stories, yeah, as they happen. Yeah, I don't see the the what the the singer that was in charge. I'm not seeing. That yeah, was back they, mention, they only they only check. mention her once. Was oh, was in the beginning? Okay. Yeah, it's, anyway. it's just a very brief mention. I don't, I don't, name okay. it. It's adorable that uh, Oradin now uh, recognizes Calls him. him. Ka- and calls Gagadin. him Gagadin. 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 <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That, oh gosh, that's, I love that. It's so cute. Okay, so Kaladin. So Kaladin now goes to meet the person that he's supposed to evacuate, the Mink, who we met in Oathbringer, <laughs> because mm-hmm. he is he likes to play with people. <laughs> he's ruthless, and I kind of love it. He left a um, dummy. He, he le- yeah, he left a dummy and snuck out. And, and I love that his, his men are just like, oh, he does this sometimes. It's like, it's what he does. Well, yeah. I just I also just love, because they're Herdazian, so it's like, uh, we don't, you don't know our gancho, Bright Lord. <laughs> <laughs> just, that phrase is so perfectly Herdazian. So is mm-hmm. gancho boss, I'm assuming? I'm it sounds like it's it everything. The way that... It frankly sounds, sounds like, like what it... they say, dude. It's like mate. Or dude or something, yeah. Mm. You don't know our dude. I like that. Okay, I'm going with that. Um, and then Kaladin and Lyrian have their fun little awkward chat because uh, they just don't see eye to eye on stuff. No. Well, I mean, there, it's an impo- it's a possible gap between the two opinions. One mm-hmm. is being like, uh, no, this is the world. Deal with it. And the other one's like, uh, we shouldn't be hurting people. You know, Hippocratic Oath type of stuff and mm-hmm. it's just like no, there's there's not really a there's not a middle ground between those two things and he's like I'm hurting people to stop them from hurting other people who aren't hurting people yeah people yeah um, but and and they, they start to get into a bit of a debate and Laren's just like I'm not gonna leave I'm not leaving the people of Hearthstone they need me here 
And Kaladin's just like, okay, then I decided we're going to bring them with us. I love his line. You've made it quite clear that you and Mother won't abandon the people of Hearthstone, so I arranged to bring them with us. And then the Final Fantasy uh, airship music starts playing, and there we go. Absolutely. Yeah. So Uh, should we jump back to... uh, So since since this is in the same chapter, let's go back to Shallan. Okay. So okay, this is so, chapter, yeah, chapter yeah, two so, still. This is still chapter two. Um, and Shallan is getting along very well with herselves. <laughs> yeah. um, they're this just is very sort of, concerning. It really is. It's one of those things, like, it happens smoothly, and she thinks, oh, I'm doing better. Mm-hmm. And from the outside, you just really worry, because this doesn't seem stable. Yeah, I, I started it, and I was like, oh, honey, no, I mean, that's not good. Who knows how it works for her? Because honestly, maybe this is the the best outcome there could be. Is just they they now have a uh, a council of opinions that voice mm-hmm. themselves, and she slips in and out of them as necessary. I mean, who knows? But it's just weird. It's different. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is that it, you know she was talking about. She said it had been like that ever since. Dot dot dot. And she starts to kind of dissociate. And Vale is like, well, maybe it's time for us to, to remember everything. You mm-hmm. know, and just, and just face it all. I'm not sure if that means that there's something else from her past that we still aren't aware of. Or if it's just a matter of Shallan, even though she has stated her oath, still hasn't fully confronted it. I don't know. Well, we know she it, hasn't uh, fully confronted everything because... She has to tell more truth. So there's got to be mm-hmm. more. Yeah. Right. Now, those that's, could that's be truths enough. that aren't as uh, historical as far as I killed someone. It could be mm-hmm. things that she needs to admit to herself. Well, for example, mm-hmm. with uh, with Elokar, his first truth was going to be I was a bad king or I am a bad king. Mm-hmm. And so it may just be a matter of admitting. Yeah. Um, admitting aspects of yourself that you're not necessarily fond of, not just. I did X, but... Well, it's it's what you're I running am. from. Because mm-hmm. for Elikar, it was the fact he was inept as a king. For Shallan, it was the truth of what she did. She's been hiding. Mm-hmm. Right. But, it, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what her remaining truths are. And, yeah. Um, so Shallan, as Vale, as Trinasha, because... <laughs> All the layers. Because, because layers. She, she's got inception level <laughs> mysteries in, inside of her. Light weavers are like cakes. Onions. Uh, and nobody parfaits. likes onions. You ain't never been. Uh, no, no we don't need to go quote and Shrek. Anyway, <laughs> she's trying to get kidnapped by the Sons of Honor. So she's I sort did of, love that first line with her, too. That's good. I liked that. Which line? Vale vale was growing increasingly upset that nobody had kidnapped her. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, what does a woman have to do to get kidnapped in a place like this? It's like, come on, I'm just right here and no one's doing it. I love the concept of just of paying somebody to go into hiding and do nothing so that you can pretend to be them. Yeah, that would be a little weird, but... Look, outsourcing is getting out of control. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so yeah, she wanders around, talks to people, complains loudly about Dalinar, um, finally mm-hmm. doesn't get kidnapped. So she heads to the wine house and Vale's just like, hey, we could keep going to the gambling house. Best to stay that. in character. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and she gets drugged and she seems a little bit too excited <laughs> that she's gotten drugged. She's, she's like, why haven't they got someone to grab me? And it's like, oh, finally, they did poison to get me. And it's like. Any other situation, this would be a terrible thing, but you're excited about it. <laughs> I also just want to point out, she didn't say she's trying to get kidnapped by the Sons of Honor. She just said she's trying to get kidnapped. Yeah, Sorry, she doesn't I'm, say I'm that right until ahead. later. Sorry, that's my fault. I was I was skimming back through as I was writing these notes, and I yeah, she just, she just says kidnapped, and she we've already given we've already given spoiler warnings, and <laughs> yeah, is anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, she doesn't. Let's see. So yeah, she disappears into oblivion and we will see her later. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, back in Hearthstone, Kaladin, Navani, Dalinar, and company are all having a grand old time. Um, so Navani and Dalinar are bringing a kind of airship 
to Hearthstone to evacuate the town. And what is its name? The Fourth Bridge. I the love bridge. that it's the Fourth Bridge. And Navani and it has, named it. It has and, part of it in it, too. Yeah. Well, and it's special to Navani because it's the bridge that saved Dalinar and Adolin. You know, it's special to us because we've Kaladin. known Kaladin and Bridge Four for so long. But for her, mm-hmm. specifically, this is the bridge that saved her husband and stepson. This whole, yeah. the, the whole, everything about this is so poetic that it's, again, one of those surprising but inevitable things that it's beautiful because Mm -hmm. uh, because there's a couple different levels of it yes the one for navani it means something Mm -hmm. for dalinar it means something for the men of bridge four it means something and it's especially poetic for them after we had the uh sort of the the eulogy for the the physical bridge Mm four uh in somewhere in oathbear i can't remember where we we lift the bridge yeah it was the interlude or not the interlude but it was the chapter that was for Rock's family. Yeah. When they and, and yeah. they go out and they give the bridge one final run. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, cuz no, we the thing that Rock this. said was uh bridge 4 will take to the skies. What mm-hmm. he didn't mean is for it to literally be prophetic that bridge 4 Oh my goodness. is taken well, to the, the skies. And that's the that's thing true. is who were the first to fly? Bridge 4. Yep. Mm-hmm. The fourth bridge is also is the first. Like first there's so many Airship. layers on this. It just keeps unfolding. It's, it's nothing it's beautiful. but a tessellating pattern of layers mm-hmm. it's absolutely wonderful and i just brandon you know sometimes Dude, the... he does an epic fight scene and sometimes he just you know rips your chest open and plays your your heart like a do you think like when he heart. came up with that he just sat there in his room and just like he got a, a strain from patting himself on the back because i know i would <laughs> Just like, oh, I think he just, oh, it's so good. It's so brilliant. Oh, <laughs> I need so to, I, like I need it. to go. And then he has to like tell his bird about how great his idea is. <laughs> uh, I think, he, I think he just would have sat back and just grinned. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the other thing that I thought was kind of cool is that when they land, a dozen edge dancers come off. So it looks like the Knights Radiant have kind of been growing. And Navani observes, it says, the last edge dancer in the group, which was a lanky girl who seems to have grown a foot in the past year. That's got to be Lyft, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's Lyft. Like, it's she's totally not, Lyft. She's not named, but it's got to be Lyft. The uh-huh. thing that's interesting about it is because the Windrunners growing was something that we expected because we saw the Windrunners not... Very gradually. Like, well, and also actively recruiting. People were trying... Mm-hmm. Well, more people trying to get recruited into them. Uh, right. But we saw nothing like that for the edge dancers because we well, knew one because singular the, yeah, edge the, dancer, and she's a you know a prepubescent girl, and mm-hmm. a prepubescent girl who has the attention span of oh look a small child, <laughs> squirrel, <laughs> and so it's one of Pancake. these things they say Pancake. edge dancers you're like wait plural, yeah plural and a dozen it, it, it threw me at first actually I was just like I, 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 I kind of was... wanted there to be a line of you know. Dalinar had sent people out looking for new radiance, but it's just, it's a year later it's and there, yeah. there's a dozen edge dancers on this ship. Well, I mean, and that's probably not all of the edge dancers because yeah, they probably have some back in your theory mm-hmm. well, and, and everywhere else. And like in any other battlefields as they reference later, it's also a problem of scale of battle because mm-hmm. we saw Dalinar and his team, his crack squad of what? 10 people or whatever it was save all mm-hmm. of, the, of Thalena versus a ton of fused mm-hmm. and right. an Amaram who, you know, was swallowing strange stone. You shouldn't do that. Uh, not, not healthy. And so it's one of these no. things you're like, okay, they were able to do that. Oh, they have 12 and, you know, all these Windrunners. What could possibly get in their way? And first thing we see in the book, a fuse of a new kind that we haven't seen. It's just they're both escalating the battle very quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, a, and this is this is book four. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now book five will be the end of an arc, but still, this is book four of ten. Yeah, and it's going to be so, like a ten-year gap or something between the two sets. So, right? I've heard anywhere between ten and twenty-five. So okay. But during those years, that's when uh, Mistborn Era oh. two takes place. So. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I think part of the reason it bugged me a little bit is because I was a little defensive of Lyft, because suddenly she's not quite as special um particularly since you know she was the last one out so it seems kind of like she's 
on a low rung in the in this order of edge or of edge dancers. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, but 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 she's our edge dancer. <laughs> yeah, at well, the I, same time, she's it, not a leader. No, she's not, and it she's makes not. it makes perfect sense why she wouldn't be. I'm just saying, I personally was a little defensive because I was like, but 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 Lyft is is the cool one. <laughs> But that's the point. Yeah, but I I don't think she would want that. Like we said, she's not a leader. She doesn't want the spotlight on her. And I think I I, I realize of all being... of this. More, I'm, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm just I'm just talking about yeah. my instinctual reaction. And, and more importantly, I think it's important for her not to be the leader because her mm-hmm. role in the story is to be the uh, the fly in the ointment. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's going to be at some point everyone's in danger, someone's dying, or whatever. And then it turns out Lyft purposely disobeyed orders or didn't even pay attention to what they were and just shows up being like... It saves the day. Just like, oh, hey, guys. There's like, Lyft, What's what up? are you doing here? And it's like, oh, you know, plot device. It's all. It's I feel all like Lyft here. is going to be sitting there, you know, captured, and somebody's going to toss her a muffin. And <laughs> she's going to be, be like, here we go. Yeah, yeah somebody's going to give her some food, and then she's going to be like... Let's do this. <laughs> no, I've figured out what I want it to be. I want it to oh, no. be that Seth like knew they were going to get into danger. What they didn't realize is that Seth had like gotten a bunch of muffin crumbles and has just slowly Hansel and Gretzel style like been laying it behind him. <laughs> and just so that, you know, Lyft would follow it and then eventually be like, whoa, I'm here. Because, <laughs> you know, I want as much Seth and Lyft as possible now since, you know. That is a fun buddy cop pair. Like, that's just... Yeah. That is not the pairing I was ever expecting, but in Oathbringer, but awesome. when they start working together, it was amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm yeah. excited to see Lyft progress, though, like, you know, because she, she first realized she didn't have to skid around on her knees at the end of Oathbringer. So now she's just had a year. You, you see her and, and, and Navani notices, you know, her lanky awkwardness. She's just like. Yeah, even being an edge dancer doesn't protect you from puberty, no, <laughs> and just the awkward the, the awkwardness of puberty. And and I'm really interested to see Lyft progress out of that childish phase into that's going to be very a young adult and an adult because she thought her promise with the the night mother was that she wouldn't age. The night watcher, night watcher, not, not mm-hmm. night mother, something different. Yeah, she said she didn't want to change. She wanted to stay the same, that's even what, if everybody else. Changed. But that's what she thought it was. Like that's the no, thing. that was no. But the wording I said that was what she requested. Yes. She thought that it meant she wasn't going to age, but clearly she is. Yeah. Yeah. So she doesn't know and now what exactly she mm-hmm. agreed to. Well, mm-hmm. she doesn't know, know what her you know boon she's been given. Yeah. It's it's, it's very int- yeah it's. You go to speak to an eldritch spren and <laughs> you're given a promise, but you don't know what the promise is. I mean, like Dalinar has, a, a, you know, a similar experience. He didn't know what his boon was. He thought his boon was something different. His boon was to forget. Mm-hmm. And he thought he'd forgotten what his boon was. Yep. And so it's just, it's really interesting to see how all of these different boons and curses and requests and stuff I wonder come if, together. if when um, Lyft starts figuring hers out it's going to help her grow in some way just like Dalinar's helped him grow yeah. I have a feeling well, it's going to have that kind of there's and anything we've seen is the fact <laughs> that uh, clearly cultivation's playing a long game yeah and so and again who were the three people who got to directly view Odium from the uh from the human side last book it was dalinar it was lift because she was able to hijack one of the dreams and be there. The stream, yeah and tara vangian and so mm-hmm. i don't think odium knows how much cultivation's probably playing him. oh yeah. no and it seems fitting that someone with the name of cultivation would have a long game because when you mm-hmm. cultivate it's not a quick process you start you with a looking, seed and you grow and you have to start way long process ahead of you and think I, about if i do that it's going to affect it this i way swear there was a line stuff. somewhere and i can't remember where it is at this point but i swear there was a line about cultivation seen further than most of the other shards she she was better at the at foresight than the, most of the others yes mm-hmm. and so um, i can't remember i can't remember if it was hoid or 
somebody else. But yeah, it, it's been said that cultivation is better at it. So yeah, it's just one of those things. It's like, I, I still wouldn't be shocked in some way if somehow cultivation ended up becoming some some antagonist of some kind that they have to overcome. I really mm-hmm. hope not. I, I, I like cultivation, actually. And I, I, I don't want cultivation to become an antagonist. Yeah, it um, just wouldn't shock I had an, I had another thought, actually, was with Teravangian. Odium, and, and sorry, this isn't, we're not talking about the, the current <laughs> chapters, but it's just a speculation that has to do with the Stormlight Archive. They knew what we were when they picked us up. <laughs> it's our show, we can do what we want. Anyway, <laughs> but um, I was thinking with Teravangian, Odium has said that he will never come to Teravangian when he's having a smart day. Mm-hmm. I feel like the smart days are when he's planning against, plotting against Odium. So Odium is never going to actually see, see that because he's never going to be able to, you know, betray it to, 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 to Odium. Because on the days where Odium will come to visit, he doesn't know the plan. No, that's true. But it does make it harder to do your plan when you can't remember it half the time. Which is why Odium agreed to terms where Odium gets to be the one to decide what directions things point. Mm-hmm. Now, it'll be interesting. Okay, so back to the Navani fort. and the airship and soaring through the sky. First off, I, I kind of want to get Jordan's take on the way that the airship works. Oh, jeez, it is. First of all, essentially, they've decided to make bridgemen, but with extra steps now. <laughs> because they're still lifting the bridge. Like they're they're actually using pulleys and stuff. Right. And, and so I just find it hilarious that that's cuz it's it's actually what it reminds me a lot of now is actually uh the sympathy magic from uh the King Killer yes. Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. Absolutely. Rothfuss. Um where you can pair things and have one a force on one thing be applied to another thing. It's the same concept that they use with the uh, uh, pairing fabric. Span, span, span reads. Yeah, and this yeah. is just taken to a, a, it's like a quantum entanglement. Um, I didn't quite understand how they move from side to side. Um, because mm-hmm. elevation I understand, but. Mm-hmm. In order for them to do that same type and of motion, they'd have to physically walk it that distance. So, mm-hmm. but she talks they, about they... she talks about how like they can pair them on certain axes, which as a physicist hurts me on a lot of levels. But um, <laughs> we broke that a long time ago, so I'll let that slide. Yeah. Um, so they. It's, it's they, an interesting concept. It's also like the thing. They, I, Go ahead. Are you, okay, so like you were saying, Jordan, I don't, I don't fully understand how they work, but they talk about like temporarily dis, disjoining the gemstones mm-hmm. so they can like reset it and go like infinite distances, but they just have to like reset in between. It's and like I don't remember if that it, changes with which axis they're working on either. I'm not. 100% it makes sure me think that. of uh, when you're when you're using a mouse and you go all the way to the right, and then you have to pick up the mouse and move it to the left side, and when you pick mm-hmm. it up, you're disjoining. Oh, great. Yeah. The, you we've, know, now created, we've now created <laughs> ship size mouse pads. <laughs> I mean, that's what the plateaus are, aren't they? Yeah, you well, to, but to, to that point, though, like, I wouldn't be shocked if we get to a point where, because of that being the system, if mm-hmm. they are able to make some sort of uh, tread style mechanic mm-hmm. where they can, when it gets to the end, somehow they get. Get a, a mechanism that takes whatever the stone is, moves it down to the bottom tread, and mm-hmm. like somehow di- like s- somehow that turns it off, and then it winds right back up. And so instead of having to bridge essentially bridge crew it where you're moving back and forth, you have set mm-hmm. up like a crank style treadmill that you can then hook up to like a windmill, and mm-hmm. then you can start automating some of this process. And and you've now created an engine. Well, and that's yeah. the thing is Brandon has done this now twice it, it, with two different magic systems because he's created airships on Scadrial using the uh, Harmonium cubes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's now created them here and it's a completely different style of airship. So it's like, Brandon, 
you want to fly, don't you? You just, you really, <laughs> really want to fly. But I like how he's, you know, sort of finding the same sorts of technologies in different ways, just sort of because people, prog- the way he's kind of got it is people want to progress, you know, step by step by step. Mm-hmm. And eventually want to get to the same place. And and even though you've got Roshar and Scadrial, which are two vastly different worlds, they're aiming in the same direction. Mm-hmm. The other thing is this is just a nice uh, call call back to sort of what she was already working on uh, at the end of... Uh, it was the end of Words of Radiance, I believe, where she made the floating platform... To oh, hold, yeah. to hold that, up you'd, the, you'd pull it down the sheets or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, all right, yep, this is definitely the next level. Yeah. yeah. Cheyenne Sedai in chat just mentions, uh, and those are our two speculations for the ones above. You know, we've got two different uh, oh. civilizations that have created air travel mm. next to space travel. I, I personally am of the opinion that the ones above are... Um, Scadrial, Scadrians. I mean, it makes sense that they're going to be able to do the most with their magic long term since they can create time and bubbles. World. Mm-hmm. Time bubbles break so much. Yeah. Makes Dr. Physics um, Professor cry. The other thing is, like you mentioned, as to creating an engine, that's the other thing. I like that Brandon has started with the very bulky and awkward form of this new technology. You know, he's not just mm-hmm. like, and they discovered this, and now they can make, you know, make... Mach, they can do Mach you know, 4. Supersonic they're, they're jets. jets. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like, no, this is the very bulky, we can, you know, have it in the air for a little bit, and we can go this speed. We can but do it's five not, knots, you know, five mile, five mm-hmm. knots, or whatever. I and also... So I like seeing the early steps of this. I love him having people dwell on the the coming obsolescence of their world. You know, you have Liren suddenly being like, okay, with Surge of Progression, just, you know, sitting around here healing people automatically, what use is there yeah, for a surgeon? What do, what do I mm-hmm. do? Yeah. yeah you, and then you have Kamakal sitting here, you know, oh, or not Kamakal. Was it Kamakal? Yeah, Wait. it's Kamakal. Okay, yes. Kamakal yeah. waxing poetic, as sailors do, about mm-hmm. the ocean. As, as aged sailors in particular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, well, she's like, well, I'm sure this is going to be a use up. for for sailors and stuff and he's like yeah but i'm just thinking you know you guys can just drop rocks on us you like you, that's not be. even that high tech yeah yeah it's just it's really it's cool to watch the progress happen like that was one of the cool things between era one and era two of mistborn we saw the advances and but in this one we're actually seeing the advances mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's just really cool yeah. and i feel like particularly in the you know jump forward 10, 15, 20 years, what is going to, pro- what is going to have progressed? Oh yeah. And so, yeah, it's a very, uh, the bitter, the bittersweet fruit of progress is it's a very good thing to dwell on. It's, a, it's mm-hmm. a, especially, uh, timely given the age that we live in, uh, where things are constantly moving at a rate that entire industries rise up and disappear in a decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that stuff is obsolete so fast. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty yeah. dang good. Okay, so actually, what's going on though? Now, yeah, like you mentioned, Prince Kamako's come along just, and and I like that she thought to bring him along because you know he's a sailor. He's and she she had like the his leader crew of, or, what, out. or not the leader, but you know the oh the married consort, to the lead, married to the leader of um a seafaring people. And he's just like, I want to get y'all's opinion on this. Yeah, she had them like take it for a stretch of distance, mm-hmm. basically just them. Yeah. And she wonders, you know, should we be using nautical terms or what? You know, uh, what, you know, what terminology do we use for this? This is all new. Mm-hmm. But the and answer then, is uh, yes. You should use yeah. nautical terms. <laughs> yeah. And then Kaladin's, you know, two fathers meet, Liren and Dalinar. <laughs> Kaladin um, has two daddies. <laughs> no, but uh, just because oh, 
Kaladin talks about himself as two different people, or th- multiple people, actually. Yeah. And, you know, Lyrian is the one who raised him, and Dalinar is now the one who's kind of raised him up from from the slave that he was. Yeah. Um, and I like that Dalinar refers to Lyrian as, uh, what is it? Not Lyrian Stormblessed. But, yeah, as Lyrian Stormblessed, and Lyrian's yes, just like, and he like Stormblessed? <laughs> And Dalinar's and like, like, apparently we haven't discussed this yet. Okay, <laughs> well, moving on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it hasn't been really mentioned that Kaladin is like we, we know that Kaladin is now a light eyes, um, as a as a radiant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and a landed um, one because uh, Elikar yeah. gave him lands uh, mm-hmm. in a very specific part of Alcar. Yeah, but we haven't really talked about, you know, what uh, you know him actually having a house. You know, and and they called it House Stormblessed. I'm like, okay, that fits. All right. Yeah. You know? And I just like that. Lyrian is not quite sure how to take that. Well, <laughs> like well, he, he just <laughs> his entire world has literally been ripped out from under him right now. Uh huh. He doesn't know what's going on. He's on a flying ship. His son's a storming <laughs> radiant. He's talking to like the the bright lord in the world. <laughs> Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And not, like not 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 just the the king of Alethkar because he's not the king of Alethkar. He's the one who the king of Alethkar swore fealty to. Yeah. yeah. And Liren's just suddenly like I was fighting with some dude over some spheres in a goblet. Like what? How did I get here? <laughs> yeah. He seems to take and... everything in stride though from the earlier chapters that he just he's like, well, I'm still dealing with the same problems, just different people in charge. The thing that's nice though is suddenly. Liren gets a peek at somebody who is very worthy of respect, respecting his son. Mm. The son that he's been having issues with. But I, I feel like this is actually a healthy thing for Liren to, to see somebody else who sees Kaladin as more than just the up. little boy who ran away to war. Mm. The other thing that's very interesting about this whole thing for Liren is the fact that he is confronting a lot all in this one scene mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. he's going like and they distract it's like well you know we'd love to get your opinion on this because you know this is a work in progress and he's sort of like okay i can do that but he he immediately you know i love it uh that there's like the war people it's like oh my goodness you put archers on top of this thing this would be amazing Liren sees it he's like this would be an amazing fairy for for mm-hmm. the injured and everyone is a hammer to which this looks like a nail. It looks like their specific <laughs> type of nail, yeah. Yeah. But not that nail, that's a different person altogether. No, no, no. I L, uh, not Ellie. And then Dalinar just kind of casually shows us how overpowered he is now. Oh my god. Because because yeah. Kaladin just mentions I'm running low on stormlight. And so he just reaches out. Just goes boop. You know, ba- basically <laughs> just, you know, gives him a, a benedictive touch on the shoulder. <laughs> And re-infuses Kaladin entirely with Stormlight and all of his spheres as well. And it's just like... To the point that he's glowing in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And it's just like, And I do do love... I think it's in here somewhere that that Navani's like, no, no, I want to get closer to watch him do it again. Yeah. So she (laughs) she leans over closer and starts taking notes in her notebook. And Mm -hmm. and Dalinar's just like, Yasna's interviewed me thoroughly and taken all sorts of notes. She's like, yeah but we don't understand how it works and we need, and because she wants to power, she wants to figure out how to power your Ethereum. Yeah. You know, cause I mean, that's the Fabriel of all Fabrials and you know, mm-hmm. Navani is just like, Ooh, this is the, the big sparkly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the fact that he says he can't power up the, the gemstones in there, the pillar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. He, he's, he's tried to directly infuse the pillar and it just didn't work. Which is interesting because oh, yeah. it seems to imply that the gems in the pillar aren't designed to hold stormlight. Perhaps not at the very minimum, not the stormlight that we're used to. Um, yeah, I don't know. Either that or it just funnels them out immediately. Yeah. Or, or it repels it or it somehow inert in some way. Oh, mm-hmm. Or or it's or it's like a magnet and it's been flipped to off and you needed to learn how to figure out how to flip it to on again. Yeah. Well, and based on some know. earlier uh, epigrams, it sounds like it was in the uh, I don't remember when it was, but they were talking about how your theory was close to honor. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I suspect that Honor's perpendicularity before it started swirling around in the high storm was beneath your theory. Because mm-hmm. they talked about just being being closer to Honor. So I'm wondering if it's just has to be a full constant perpendicularity that's there. Either that or um, and I, I think they're on the right track thinking it has something to do with the sibling. Yeah, there may, perhaps yeah. it just needs a specific spren inside it. It's maybe it's a fabrial without a spren. Yeah, well, what I think yeah. of it as personally, I think it's like trying to run a two-stroke engine with four-stroke oil or something like that. It's just hmm. the engine is not designed for that type of liquid inside mm-hmm. of it, and so there's something about the sibling that must do something that interacts it and get, does sort of a catalytic conversion. Sometimes either that or again, like like we were saying, fabrials have a spren inside of a gemstone. Yeah. Perhaps the sibling is the spren that powers this. And so technically it's not a fabrial because there is no spren inside. Once the sibling returns, perhaps that's how it'll work. Mm. Of course, we know things that Navani and them don't know. So yeah. Yeah. And then Dalinar meets the mink. Yep. And the mink, I, I'm excited to, I, I, I want to see more <laughs> interactions with the mink because he just seems fun (laughs) the king of the dramatic entrance like i didn't think that you should put all your points into that but he's making a good (laughs) argument it's the batman entrance yep yeah and he you know he's just sort of he's there and talking there's like refugees go downstairs he's like all right i'll let my men know but for now you know (laughs) yeah no i'm I'm excited to see more because it's basically if you take lopin and you make him a grizzled war veteran now that you call him, like, Batman, now I'm just imagining, like, a, a Batman-style <laughs> character, but with a mink mask instead of a bat. So it has no. those short, round ears. Mink man. Bat mink. Yeah. Mink man. I like mink man. And, uh, and of course, he'll be voiced, played by Kevin Conroy. Of course. In the movie. So, <laughs> And then, of course, as, they're, as they continue to load up the refugees on the fourth bridge, the fused attack. L- L- uh, Lynn... Shows up, does her awesome three-point landing on the deck. They all do. That's and... that's day one training of flying. Oh, of you course. can't fly till you know how to land. <laughs> With style. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and of course, immediately the fused attack and cliffhanger. Ah. Just love it. Yeah. Just it's got to be great. It's just the. I didn't expect things to move, progress this far forward with the technology. It's going a lot faster than I expected. Yeah, the technology or the orders. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't expect there to be an entire, you know, quorum of edge dancers at this point. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, who knows how I, many I of the other ones there are. Mm-hmm. I think a big factor is that we've said before, like, that Nail's not killing them anymore. That's, that's, a, that's it's a big very one. Very true. Because there, there's things happening and, you know, and the mm-hmm. Sprinter going around trying to find people. And if everybody keeps getting killed, then you can't really grow your orders until they're not killed anymore. One thing Brandon has mentioned about this book is apparently we are going to see a lot more dust bringers and they're going to have a big part in this book. So Which I'm just like, me. OK, then. I mean, because really right now we've only got like one Malata. example of a dust bringer, but, you know, we only had one example of an edge dancer. And yeah, here so we go. It's... So. Who knows? And I, I mean, it could go either way with the Dustbringers because it could just be that Malata's spren is mm-hmm. anti-radiant or... Or maybe all of them are. Or all of... If they all are, then... Oh, maybe all the Ash spren are angry. Mm-hmm. If but I mean, you also look at how Sild is not like all the other honor spren. Yeah. If there's anything Brandon has hates as a trope is these are the people that are all like this one way. They're cookie cutter. And they're Brandon all, really likes to like, explain um, any group through by the exception. Yeah. yeah. And you can just go down a stinking list on that one. <laughs> yeah, he, he's done it several times, starting with... Starts, uh, prop- Sazed. Yeah, I think Sazed's the best. Even Hraithen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because Hraithen is not... That's true. Uh, he's actually a true religious. believer. He's not about the power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's just, yeah. I, I am looking forward to uh, to all this stuff. Okay. All right. Well, we do love hearing from our 
listeners. So please keep sending us your questions. You can go ahead and ask us about the Cosmere. You can drop us your ideas for topics you want to you want for us to discuss during the show while you're at it. We would love to hear your feedback about how you think we are doing, as well as any interesting theories that you might have about what's going on in the Cosmere. We would love to discuss those on the show as well. Uh, send all questions and suggestions in a brief, concise email to Cosmere studies at gmail.com. And we might read that as part of the show. Uh, if you'd prefer to send us a physical letter, we do have a PO box at the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere studies, PO box 970063. Orm, Utah, 84097. We do have our own personal projects outside of the, uh, the podcast. So, Jordan, where can we find your stuff? Why don't you start uh, You off? can find me on twitch.tv slash splice stream. Uh, today, we just la- launched an Indiegogo for uh, the prize pool of my big giant tournament, Gauss, that is uh, wrapping up. So if you're interested in either getting an Amiibo stand, a customized T-shirt, or one of our rare uh, custom-painted Amiibo that I'm painting myself, go check it out and see if uh, those things interest you, if you'd like to support it. Yeah. And Amy, how about you? So, my Facebook is Coincidence Cosplay and Props. My Twitter is at Coincidence Cosp. Why? Because my name is too long. Okay. <laughs> my Instagram is at Coincidence underscore Cosplay, and my website is www.coincidencecosplay.com. So, I've been trying to send children to school that's tomorrow actually my daughter starts school tomorrow um so that's crazy but um no i've been i've trying to make vin finished and these are my two different versions i don't know if you can see them but <laughs> this is the first nice. one i tried that is nine inches long and this it will be totally clear it just has the backing paper and it still is clear vinyl and this one is my uh now 16 inch one which actually fits my hand correctly oh so, nice so that'll be nice. So I will be posting about figuring out how not to screw those up when I make them look more blade-like and making my son's D20 and probably wig work and various and sundry things. But yes. Various so that's and sundry. All the crazy things. Yes. Awesome. And when I'm not here, I do have another podcast with my friend Dylan about board games called The Innkeeper's Table. We release new episodes on Friday mornings. It is available on pretty much any of the major podcast sites you can think of. So go ahead and listen to us there. You can also check out our Instagram page at Innkeeper's Table Podcast. Um, Our most recent episode, we talked about Kickstarter as a vehicle for publishing and buying board games. I have way too many Kickstarters (laughs) waiting to fulfill. I think I counted today and it was 18. Um, a few of those are uh, Brandon Sanderson related, including the Mistborn Dice and the Leatherbound um, Stormlight Book One. Guys, I got my uh, my survey today, so I, I submitted too. that I am an edge dancer and will be mm-hmm. getting edge dancer goodies. Um, and then our next uh, episode is going to be about legacy style board games. So. Um, I actually want to give a little bit of a rundown of what a legacy game is, just because that doesn't may not make sense to people. So the first legacy game was a game called Risk Legacy, where they basically took Risk and they made it so the way a game goes matters in all subsequent games. So like if somebody destroys a country, it could be wiped off the map. You may like completely destroy a country you may put a sticker over it there some countries may merge together and you rename it you know you call it uh jordanlandia or or jordania i guess would be a that's i'm not that (laughs) arrogant splice town yes you are right of course um and one of the first things that actually does is it's you know you something major happens and it may it tells you to destroy a card like to literally rip it in half and throw it away. And it just sort of is a, okay, guys, buckle up. This is what's going on. So we're going to be talking about legacy games in the uh, next episode of the innkeeper's table, which is coming out this Friday. You know, um, the the best addition- thing about legacy games is you don't have to participate in them to end up enjoying that. Your roommates <laughs> are going through them. I can attest to this. <laughs> Jordan has walked through a few where we've, there were strange s- things happen. There's so many times I just went upstairs to get a snack and they say things like I'm attacking the armoire and I'm just like, I'm sorry. What? I know I'm late to this party, <laughs> but I need someone to explain literally anything right context. now. And it's just the, like the armoire the- attacked us first. So oh. we fought back. And, and in my head, all I hear is, no, you must face the gazebo alone. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, in addition to the podcast, I do have a bunch of board game reviews over at www.innkeeperstable.com. I also post about games on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All of those use the handle at Innkeeper's Table. For those of you who do want to support the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies podcast, but you can't become patrons just yet for whatever reason, we would love it if you would just let your friends know about our show. Um, just, you know, tell them what you think. Uh, help, you know, get them to listen. We would love that. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to like and subscribe over on youtube.com slash Cosmere Studies. So before we go, any final thoughts on these two chapters? I, or really I anything like, we've discussed tonight? I did like at the beginning of chapter three, how everybody was super concerned about Navani being too close to the edge. And they're like, Dalinar, can't you, can't you make your stop? And he's like, uh, this is her ship. I'm not about to touch that at all. <laughs> I'm not going to get after her to get away from the edge. And, and nope. then you notice, though, and she gets a little irked because he immediately promises to use her ship. To help in, in certain ways, and she's like, he, he, he's just like, yeah, anno- yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. And she's like, but it's you just called it my, it's mine. And she's annoyed at how irked she is. She's annoyed at herself for, for being irked, but she is annoyed mm-hmm. at him for behaving that way. Which yeah. you know, it all kind of makes sense. So it almost they, yeah. they, you know, they sound like a married couple to me. Huh. They, I can confirm. Yeah, there are moments that I'm like, yeah, I've I've had that thought, or I've mm-hmm, that. Yeah, that seems real. Yeah, it's kind of... I'd buy it. Part of it is because they've each kind of had their domains, and at this point, those domains are kind of starting to overlap now. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's starting to use the Fabrioles that she's been focusing on creating and everything in war, where he is, you know, the the ultimate authority. Mm -hmm. And so it's just sort of a... Because they're starting to overlap, there's a little bit of conflict there. Yeah. I like, though, that... You know, I say a little bit of conflict. It's not... You know, it's, it's, stewing it's conflict amongst it, it's tension, yeah. yeah. But but it's handled maturely between amongst the all of them. Mm-hmm. And so you know, she's probably going to talk to him about it, and he'll I realize, could, oh, I, 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 I was kind of a like, yeah. Like and, you, and he'll realize I did, I didn't even did. realize I was doing this. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who want to, no, I already did that. Um, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. For our next episode and the next few moving forward, we're going to keep digging into the Rhythm of War preview chapters. So join us for the discussion in two weeks on September 7th at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. And that's our big next announce- time- that's our announcement, right? Yep. Ne- yes. Next time we're going to be talking about chapters four and five and then, but you want to be there because we're going to be making a big announcement at the beginning of the episode. So make sure not to miss that one. Until then... On behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening, and remember, there's there's always always another another secret.